Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We're going to begin today's program in the kitchen. With the hot summer weather, it's nice to have something to eat that's on the cool side and requires very little kitchen prep. So let's join Marco Ayala in his kitchen. He's preparing a Mexican dish in which he relied on his sister for a little help. It's that time of the year when we're craving fresh food. And by fresh, I don't only mean fresh out of your garden or fresh out of your um, local farmer's market, but food that is fresh, that cools you down. Keeping that in mind, if you're anything like me, you're already planting and tending to your garden. So this year I decided to plant a bunch of cucumbers and radishes. So thinking ahead of what to do with them, I talked to my sister and she shared with this recipe with me that I am sure you're really going to enjoy. This is a cucumber tuna radish salad that my sister makes for her family on a regular basis. And it's not only a very cool recipe because it, lit it literally cools you down, um, but it's also very budget friendly, which is another thing that I really like about it, aside from the fact that it's absolutely delicious. And I'm going to serve some here in this little plate that we have over here while I'll tell you a little bit more about it. I want to also put some of the juice in there. Look at that. So, to make it, it's really easy. You want to start by cutting a cucumber. And my grandmother always taught me to rub the ends in order to take the bitterness out of the cucumber. Then you want to uh, peel it completely, cut it in half, remove all the seeds, and then chop the cucumber into small pieces. Once you're done with that, it's time to chop those radishes. And I find that the easiest way to cut radishes is to cut them all the way almost to the end, and then you turn them 90 degrees and cut again. That way you have uh, somewhat of a grid that then you can cut, and then the radishes come out perfectly chopped. Once you add your radishes, you want to cut your cilantro. And I am very generous with it because I personally love cilantro, but you can use as much or as little as you will like. At this point, you want to add your tuna, which has already been drained. So you just add it and then mix it into the radishes and the cucumbers. It's also optional to add a few jalapenos. And I personally add a little bit of the juice that they come in because that really brightens up the recipe. Again, this is optional. If you don't like spicy food, you can just leave it out, but it really adds a little zest that your family is really going to love. Then it's time for the signature of a lot of Mexican dishes, limes. And you want to cut about four to five limes and then squeeze them into your mixture. If you like onions, you can also add a little bit of chopped onion, and now it's time for spices. So for this recipe, I add about one tablespoon dill wheat, about one tablespoon pepper, and one tablespoon salt. You mix it all together, and then you want to put it in the fridge and let it rest for a few hours, mostly because the salt is going to extract some of the juices and it's going to marinate all the mixture and it's going to make it taste really, really good. And once you bring it out of the fridge, it's ready to serve. And I personally like to serve it with tortilla chips, which are my favorite, but you can also use crackers or whatever you have available. Um, even some pita bread will be great with this. And look at that. What you do is just put a good mound of your salad onto a tortilla chip and you're ready to enjoy it. Also remember to follow us on social media for more across the fence content delivered right to your computer or your phone. Happy cooking. As always, you can find our recipes on the Across the Fence website. From the kitchen, we head to the garden. Here's Leonard Perry with some tips on growing your own potatoes. Here we have some potatoes growing, and you may wonder what this structure is around that netting. Well, this is insect netting. 
Now, I've grown potatoes for quite a few years, and one year, middle of summer, they just, in a few days, all went down. I did like you know, a lot of you can do, is contact a plant diagnostic clinic and found out basically it's leaf hoppers came in on a warm front, were blown in, and so leaf hoppers can actually destroy a plant in a very short time. Hence, I've started using this netting just to be sure. You don't always need it. You can probably get by without it. Last year, I had some plants that didn't, you know, didn't have a problem, but just to be safe, I've got some. So what it is is a netting you can buy online. It's called insect netting. You could use like a remain material, spun bonded material, but um, that you don't see through. It doesn't last as long. This isn't that much more expensive and it will last for years. Treat it well. Held on by simple uh, paper clips here on a uh, simple pipe. You can get it at any hardware store. And we'll just roll this back like I do every time I need to water these um, or check them. Now, very simple. And once we do that, you see they're growing actually in bags. Now that's a way I like to grow other vegetables too, not just potatoes. Um, it's a simple way if you don't have a lot of space, say you have a patio or balcony, you don't have a field, uh, you can grow them in these bags. Um, you can get different size bags, different colors. These are 15 gallon, well, 15 gallons of mix, but you can get 10 gallon and 5 gallon and shorter ones. I sometimes like to grow root crops in these. You can grow lettuce, you can grow a tomato. I like to put a tomato in one of these, uh, just stake it well. And so a lot of things you can grow in here. So you get this bag. I like the ones um, that tend to have handles on them. Like over here, there's some, um, so they get fairly heavy because you use like a topsoil in these, a bag topsoil is what I use. Now it has, um, it's already been prepared, has some compost. And I like to add a little bit more in there, maybe a, <clears throat> one part of compost and manure to uh, three parts of the topsoil. Mix it up well. The other nice thing with potatoes, they tend to like a little bit more acidic soil, so you can add a little sulfur to this. You don't have to worry about changing your garden soil. Um, it's very simple in a bag you know, to make it a little more acidic for these. One of the things I like to, reasons I like to grow potatoes in these, they're very easy to grow and harvest, uh, as we'll talk about, and you can grow a lot of different varieties growing your own than you can find in the store. And there's some just great ones. One of my favorite is a uh, one called Corolla, and there's uh, German Butterballs, the Yukon Golds that are more common in stores, but um, there's some places that just sell seed potatoes. Now you don't want to use potatoes from the store, you want to use those that um, come in the spring, they have sprouts on them, they're grown just for uh, growing potatoes. So you fill a bag, make this mix up, uh, fill it about a third full, only about a third, uh, push those potatoes down um, just into the soil. When they sprout after two or three weeks and start growing and get up to about um, six inches or maybe uh, about the top of the rim of the bag, then you add another third soil, cover, fill it more in. So they're mostly covered and then they'll grow up. This is about six weeks of growth. Uh, I like to plant in the first, uh, first part of May and then should have potatoes starting in about the middle of July. So maybe about 10 weeks. So um, I've planted the end of June and had potatoes the end of summer. So um, or for in early fall. So you can space them out. You can harvest when the plants start to die back uh, naturally after that time. Or if you get hungry beforehand after they're like this, you can probably find little potatoes started down there. Get, I'd give them a little bit longer, but you can dig around and find those. You see uh, these posts to help stake them. Um, these are just bamboo with some string. And I find a very good cap to help protect your eyes are pencil erasers just on the little bamboo stakes for those. So. Um, with that, you can grow a lot of different types of uh, potatoes. Um, there's a bit more on my website, Perry's Perennial Pages, perrysperennials.com. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about bag culture uh, or check, um, there's lots of other sources online or your local uh, garden store that has trained nursery professionals. Thank you, Leonard. Our final segment today traces the history of the Long Trail. Students in the UVM Reporting and Documentary Storytelling Program spoke with writer Reedon Newquist about the end-to-end -end trail from Massachusetts to the Canadian border. I think the Long Trail is the essence of Vermont. It's demanding and it's beautiful. The Long Trail and the Green Mountain Club began in 1910 
when James P. Taylor was frustrated because there were no hiking trails in Vermont. So he had the idea of a long trail that would run from the Massachusetts line to the Canadian border. Among the most famous early long trail end-to-enders were the three musketeers who hiked without male escort in 1927. Taylor was good at publicity, so he made sure that there was coverage in papers all across the country. And of course, these three young women were attractive, sporty looking, so they became quite popular. Our thanks to the students in the UVM Reporting and Documentary Storytelling Program, which is part of the Center for Research on Vermont. Once again, thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well. <laughs>